Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jeff must use this last time. It was really short. Just kidding. Um, <clears throat> Roxy started us out, and actually Bob was going to be here, to, and they were going to play good cop, bad cop. So Roxy had to be both this morning. Um, but I want to shift your focus after them away from, so they kind of, they, in one person, kind of dwelt on the needs of the institution, and I want to shift your focus away from that and the needs instead of the giver to give. Now, as Roxy said, in October, starting next week, we're going to begin our, our stewardship drive, and you'll be invited to give to the ministries of the congregation, and I think we'll be um, talking in terms of monthly giving, um, maybe thinking in terms of a percentage giving. The biblical tithe is 10%, and maybe we're not there, but can we go from 1% to 2% in the coming year, or 2 to 3%, that sort of thing, and, and to plan that into your budget. And again, that is for the sake of the giver and our need to give more so than to meet the needs of a budget or an institution. I want to invite you to consider that in terms of this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, So you have a sidewalk, not quite a sidewalk yet, but preparations for one. And I was struck by this sidewalk. This is in Sunrise and... They're extending the sidewalks about a half a mile, I think. Um, But I was surprised. They've been at this for about a month. How much preparation, how much foundation goes into putting a sidewalk in? They didn't just dig up the grass and throw down some cement. They've been doing a lot of prep work, getting ready for that, and they're not quite ready even yet. So think in terms of, of this path... And I invite you to think about the path that we walk in life and what is the foundation for the path that we walk. Notice on the other side of the street, I don't know if you can really see it, but there's another path, and maybe that's a different path that we walk. So what's the foundation for the path that we walk in life, and what is that that path that we are on? And I would suggest that the foundation for a Christian is Jesus' death and his resurrection and the hope that we have in Jesus for new life and for eternal life, the hope that we have through Jesus in God. Now, the other path on the other side maybe is hope that's placed somewhere else, maybe in our income or our success or our status, maybe acceptance by others or our possessions. So the foundation, again, is where you place your hope and then the path that you walk through life. Where does that lead? So consider three three questions. Who are we? Who are we in this story of the rich man and Lazarus? And then what is our foundation for the path that we walk through life? And what are we trying to build on that foundation? Now we, I think we're, I was originally going to look for a, a, there's plenty of building going on on South Hill. I was going to look for a foundation that we're building a house on. But I actually couldn't find any foundations just sitting there, so went this route instead. And I kind of like this idea of, of a path through life and the foundation. Um, because we have a foundation for that too. So the first question, who are we in the story of the rich man and Lazarus? So the, the story begins, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what what fell from the rich man's table. And so you have two choices. Are we the rich man or are we Lazarus? And in, I wish Bob was here because I'm quoting him in in the Tuesday morning Bible study, he said, not me, because being loyal to the cougars, he would never wear purple. So he could not be the rich man. But how about the rest of us? I think maybe most of us, maybe all of us, we like to say they are rich. I am not. We can always find somebody who's richer and say they're the rich person. I I am not. But if we're honest, I think we are rich, and you've probably heard that before. In our reading in 1 Timothy, it says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. 
And most of us, would you agree, have food and clothing. But I think we want more than this. We feel we need more, and most of us are not content with these. We're not content with just food and clothing. Again, to be, if we're honest with ourselves, I think we are rich. Now, to clarify, it's not bad to be rich. I don't think the message of this story is that it's bad to be rich, but the problem comes with what the rich man does with his wealth or what he doesn't do. So dressed in purple and fine linen, who he feasted sumptuously every day. He has food and clothing and to spare, doesn't he? Again, there's no hint of judgment here. I don't, in the fact that he wears purple and he, he eats well, I don't think there's any judgment there. But it goes on, and at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Now it's implied, and I think it's pretty certain, that the rich man didn't share even the crumbs from his table with this hungry man outside his gate with Lazarus. And this is where the problem lies. His dining sumptuously and at the table at the same time ignoring the plight of Lazarus are because of the foundation that he has built for his life. It's also the definition that he has for what really life really is. So the second question, what is our foundation for the path we walk? Remember, our foundation is our hope, where our hope is placed, and then our hope determines the path that we walk in life. So in the psalm reading, it said, Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. And maybe we can extend that to all mortals. So that would include ourself, that would include our possessions, that would include human institutions and armies. Don't put your trust in mortals. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. And 1 Timothy echoes the same thing. Those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. So some have switched to the other side of the street and and are now walking on that path over there, on the other side with that other foundation. But the psalm, back to the psalm, it also says, Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and who keeps faith forever. In other words, happy are those who, who choose this path with this firm foundation. So based on these readings, it seems that we are at a crossroads and we need to choose which way we will, we will go. Remember what Jeff said last week, that we cannot choose both God and wealth. You can't try to serve both. It's either one or the other. So what is the path we will walk through life? And what is the foundation on which this path is built? And then what is the destination at the end of that journey? Is our destination a worldly one, with the foundation built on our hopes for things like like house and possessions and bank accounts and a secure retirement? Or, on the other hand, do we choose the way that leads to an eternal destination? I think you can see that one is pretty short-sighted, really, isn't it? and the other has eternal implications. Now, clarification. Notice the path on the right there. You can see in the foreground, and then all of a sudden, I don't know if you can really see that in the top right corner, it comes to a, it's still grassy there, and then the path continues after a little piece of grassy spot there. And I think maybe what we can draw from that is that eternal life is not something that starts down there after that little break there and then eternal life continues out of sight and into eternity yet eternal life begins right here right where these cones are and extends into eternity it's the path that you choose to walk that begins now and leads on so either path we can choose one side of the street or the other and then what is the destination at the end of that path So what are we trying to build? Again, it depends on our foundation. 
We want the sumptuous feast, I think, that the rich man enjoys. I think we like that. In the Christian Sense Century article, Peter Marty, he was they have a they've been having a contest lately where they give you one word and they invite people to write a story about that one word. And and so this most recent article or edition has feast as the word, and so people wrote in about experiences with feasts. And Peter Marty says about these people that wrote in, he said, none of these feast stories mentions mountains of food. Instead, they describe a feast as a meal shared between people, sometimes in the most unremarkable places. And so in the first story, the person wrote in and they they talked about serving a meal at a church and how the meal was for the homeless, the hungry, the marginally employed, and and lonely people and how they would come and, and eat there. And this one person named Philip he took it upon himself to, the person wrote, Philip kept the meals going during holidays and bad weather, sometimes by himself, because he never wanted anyone to show up and discover a locked door. In the process, he transformed those meals into a joyous celebration of our common connection. Each, e- each evening was full of laughter and joking, and folks drifted from table to table to greet each other. And the second story was, was a Lutheran professor teaching at a Catholic seminary in Cairo, Egypt. And she was talking about how one night um, they came upon, her and some other professors, came upon some workers out on the street and they were gathered around an enormous bubbling pot of noodles cooked with meat and creamy cheese sauce. They saw that they were admiring the food, that we were admiring the food, and immediately invited us to join them. The workers passed paper plates, plastic flatware, and baggies filled with sweet tamarind juice, whatever that is. Passed that to us in the fading light. There on the sidewalk, Americans and Egyptians, men and women, Christians and Muslims, feasted together. So another example. A third story was written by somebody that... Otis, an 87-year-old neighbor, actually landlord where they were living, Otis told this story about himself when he was a boy. He described the grandest meal that he ever ate. He said he came from a large and a poor and a rural family. This was probably back in the 19th century, late 19th century. And their family was hungry and desperate. And so he and his younger brother, they set out to try to scrape together some food so that they would or some money to get some food so they would do odd jobs for the neighbors was the plan but they went door to door and everybody else was kind of in the same situation as they were they didn't have any money either until the second day when they were out scavenging for odd jobs they came upon this widow knocked on her door and she said that that the two of them could weed her large garden and so they set to work doing that and they worked and worked for a couple hours and then they were sitting there tired And the story goes, they were sitting in the middle of the sun-baked garden, summoning the strength to keep going when the woman came walking toward them across the yard with a jug of water and two peanut butter and banana sandwiches. I can still see, smell, and taste that sandwich, says Otis, who calls it the dearest, most delicious nourishment he'd taken in all his life. So the point of this and what Peter Marty said in the introduction, none of these feasts are sumptuous in the way we would think of it. But what do they all have in common? They have in common about being together with others, about sharing and about generosity. And the lesson learned is that because of these ingredients, sharing and generosity and the connection of being together, each one is a feast. So as I explained in the children's time, God's command is that we love God and we love our neighbor. We can't claim to love God if we don't love our neighbor. And by loving our neighbor, we show that we love God. And I think that's especially true with Lazarus and our neighbors like him. In the prayer we prayed, O God, rich in mercy, you look with compassion on this troubled world. And then with the psalm, we heard about God, that God is one who executes justice for the oppressed and who gives food to the hungry, and it goes on, the prisoners and the, and the blind and etc. And if God cares about these, 
how can we not do the same? If God obviously cares about the plight of Lazarus, how can we, as the rich man, not do the same? Who is Lazarus among us today? On Monday, some of us went down and and served lunch at the New Hope Resource Center. And Rochelle told me afterwards about how one of the women that came there to eat had talked to her about her faith and how it was because Christians had reached out and had cared about her that she was baptized and was getting connected with a worshiping community and how, how it had changed her life. And it brought Rochelle to tears. And then on Wednesday, she and I went over and we met the new principal at Fir Grove. And as part of our conversa- conversation with him, he talked about the community of Hidden Glen. I don't know if you've heard of them. It's, uh, or that community, it's manufactured homes. I think it's on 160th in the dip. Um, you go down and then before you go back up, there's apparently a big... Uh, community of mobile homes there, and Fir Grove's population is 50% Hispanic. We would never realize that, I don't think, and in large, in large part comes from that mobile home community. And do we even see them? Do we even see that? One of the teachers, I don't know if it's true or not, but she said that the uh, boundary line for who goes to Fir Grove and who goes to whatever it is, Brulette or Carson, was drawn around that mobile home community to make sure that none of them got to go to Brulette or Carson, but instead they're all at Fir Grove. Do we see the Lazarus among us today? Again, we cannot claim to love God and not even see our neighbor, especially as we step over them as we leave our gated community. I think the message for us who are rich... We are blessed with whatever wealth we have, not just to make ourselves comfortable and secure, but to see our neighbor, to see Lazarus, and to share, and to be generous, and to smooth their path a bit as well. And in so doing, God promises that we really live, that this is the way to true life. So again, the question at the beginning, where are we in this story? One commentator said that we're actually the five sisters and brothers of the rich man. So if you remember at the end of the parable, he says to Father Abraham, I beg you, send to him, send him, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. But the rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham says, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. So if that's true, if we are the ones who are still alive, we have been warned about the foundation we are building and the path that we walk. We have Moses and the prophets. We have the scriptures. We have the manna lessons of God's economy, which means to trust in God, that God provides We have that assurance that God will not leave us or forsake us. We have the lessons that confirm God's care for the poor and the hungry. And the question is, will we follow? We have even someone that has risen from the dead. And the question, will we, the five sisters and brothers, heed the warning before it is too late? Will we make sure we are building on the solid, solid foundation of hope in Jesus Christ and in God, rather than placing our hope in our possessions? and in our own wealth. God's law telling us how we are supposed to live convicts us on the path that we have chosen to walk and how we have chosen the wrong path. But the good news points us on the way to life and invites us to walk that path instead, the path with the solid foundation. So in closing, I want to share with you again what we heard in 1 Timothy As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And with hope in God as our foundation, we are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of the life that really is life. Amen.